Pete. Hello, all you hardcore boxing fans out there. How are you doing? It's Big Porky here, the voice of hardcore boxing. But then again, you already know that, don't you? Because that's why you've tuned in. Today, I'm joined by Daryl from Sydney, Australia, but he's a Luton lad. How are you doing, Daryl? Good, mate. Good. Good to be on. Thanks a lot. I've watched the channel for a couple of years, so uh, yeah. Yeah, glad to finally meet you, Ross. Thank you very much. It's nice to get somebody on who uh, loves the boxing. Uh, don't worry about being called a casual or a hardcore in the comments section. You have to take all that like I do. Take it as a pinch of salt. Read it every now and then and have a laugh, but take it as a pinch of salt. But people who tune into this channel are diehards. The, the main reason I know the diehards is because... We have analytics on show uh, behind the scenes you know, on the computer and they show me little things like, for example, we've got about 5,000 subscribers, but the videos do about an average 4,000 now, you know, three to 4,000 views. So we're getting like 70% of people who subscribe watch. But if you get somebody who's got like Coogan, what's he got about 600,000? He don't get half a million every video, does he? You know, so yeah. my little following is you could say it's a bit of a cult following couldn't you i suppose and and it's manageable for me at the moment just just about but we're getting to the stage where it might not be in another year but don't take anything to heart that anything says about you in the comment section the few that i've had on here in the last two months since we've been doing this have uh, not wanted to come on again because they feel that the people have said things about them in certain comments and that. So like I've just said to you, Daryl, whatever we talk about today, just speak in your opinion, because I give everybody the chance to say what they want and, and have, have an opinion. And it's called interacting in it and boxing community, whatever you want to call it, hardcore fans, casual, it's boxing talk in it, whether it's two men having a fight, 50 odd year old or 20 odd year old, it's boxing in it. So you're all right with that. Yeah. Sounds good. Let's do it. And I'll throw you some stuff, some questions. At you. So you're living in Sydney, you're working in marketing and you're from Luton. How old are you, Daryl? 30, mate. Just 30. 30. Oh, so, you yeah. How long have you been in Sydney, Australia? About five years now. So, uh, yeah, come over for work. Um, I was working in marketing back in, back in the UK, living in London for about seven, eight years and just fancy a bit of a change. So I've moved over here. Um, and yeah, life's been good. It's raining at the moment. Um, it's been raining for about three, four weeks. Worst summer we've had in about three, coming on to three years. Um, but yeah, I can't complain too much. It beats being in Luton, that's for sure. So uh, yeah, yeah. shout out to from Luton. But uh, yeah, Sydney's a, a little bit better than that. So, Have you got uh, a good life out there, Daryl? Great life, mate. If anyone's been over here, um, they'll know. So it's a lot of like, a lot of beaches and uh, good weather, lots of parks. It's very much like an outdoors type place. So uh, if you're yeah, into yeah, yeah. outdoors and all that kind of stuff, this is the place to be. Is there any crocodiles there? There is actually. You, you go up to like, um, if you go up to like Queensland, which is a, a couple of states north. If you if, if you imagine like Sydney, if you fly um, three or four hours north of Sydney, you get to uh, Queensland, and there's you've got alligators and crocodiles, um, mainly mainly in um, like. Um, nature reserves and parks and stuff you wouldn't just see them walking down the road you're, you're right there but um, like in florida where they walk around the streets don't they and golf courses yeah we get we get kangaroos in the streets but not not the crocodiles and alligators so you're right there all oh, right all right then there's snakes and all that as well though aren't there out there and that yeah there are a few you got you got to be careful you got to be careful you, you like, like if you've got any shoes don't leave them outside you might find like a redback spider in there or something mad like that yeah like, do you uh, always check your shoes in the morning <laughs> I don't leave anything outside, mate. <laughs> Lock, all the doors. Lock all the doors and windows. I don't leave anything outside. <laughs> <laughs> it's not bad, is it? No, I'm joking. In Sydney itself, it's fine. But if, if you're out in like more of the regional areas, so if you're out like two, three hours drive out of the city, then yeah, you've got to be, you've got to be very careful. Man. But in the city, you'll be okay. I've heard of there's people uh, gone out there. Is it out back or in the bush or summer or whatever? And they've got lost and lost, and they've ended up dying because of eat and stuff. Mate, there was a, just just over the weekend. Now there was a, a group a group of eight people went canyoning, so like swimming, going down, hiking, and going down canyons. Um, about an hour outside of Sydney, just in some like some mountainous region there, uh, two of the people fell into the water, 
They got trapped in a whirlpool and they both died. So that kind of stuff just happens every other week. Like people just go and hiking or go on a little expedition and, you yeah. know, falling, falling, uh, falling foul of their conditions. But it does happen from time to time. Yeah. All right, then. Interesting. Uh, I'll throw some boxing questions at you now. Uh, do you think Tyson Fury beats Anthony Joshua? I do. I think Tyson Fury's... Um, reach his his uh, body movement and his and his hand speed would be a bit too much for um for joshua i know in recent times joshua has changed his style up so he's become a bit more of a sort of back foot boxer in terms of when you've seen him against pulev in the second andy Ruiz fight he moved around a lot more but i don't think that'll be anywhere near enough to beat um tyson fury i think he's too well schooled for him but saying that um if he if potentially he gets on the inside and and works his uppercuts like he did against Klitschko, it could make it interesting. But if I had to pick, I'd, I'd say um, Fury would, would have been on points, to be honest. Yeah. Do you think that's a, a poor indictment for the current heavyweight scene, Fury having all that time off coming back and dominating? Do you think that says a lot for the era that we're in? Uh, yes and no. The reason why I say potentially no is because I think Fury will be competitive in any era. Like, I think Fury, Fury's height and and his size and how he moves for a man of that size and how he how he uses his attributes in that way and how he i think he, he, he give any heavyweight of any generation a hard time um but then when you look below that and you look at like wilder joshua ruiz and you, and you had them in like let's say a tournament they all beat each other probably a couple of times if they were to fight each other two three times they'd all probably have a couple of wins and losses against each other so i think fury is just that standout of the generation to be honest yeah yeah. Do you feel that it'll be not this year or do you think it'll be next year? They're definitely going to wait for the crowds to come back. With this virus situation, I, I think they want to maximise that that big fight and, and get as much revenue as possible. So I definitely don't... It, it depends on the virus. Like, if if there's no crowds back this year, um, then I don't think it'll happen this year. Um, if we get crowds back by June, then maybe they put it on like November, December time, potentially. But yeah, I think they definitely want a situation where they've got full full crowds. Whether it's in um, the UK or not, I don't know. What do you think? Do you think it would be in, in, in the UK? Do you think it would be somewhere else? Uh, well, Tyson's very greedy for money. Joshua's very greedy. All the people around them are very greedy. Boxing is built on greed. They'll not be bothered when it comes to it about all these belts or this undisputed or where it's at, they will go where the biggest paycheck is, right? Um, that's just the nature of the beast. They'll say, yeah, but we're going out to Saudi or China, but we've got to think of our families and blah, blah, blah. But my opinion is it'd be in bad taste. The biggest fight in history with two Brits and it's not in England. But then again, you could say biggest fight prior to that war, Foreman Ali, that were in Zaire, wasn't it? Yeah. They were Americans, so it boxing. It do, I can explain it. It's a sport of ill repute, so to speak, isn't it? It's there's no. It's the wild, wild west, and it's not governed. And they'll go work biggest paycheckers, and why should they give three or four million quid of it to sanctioning body people and so, or whatever it's going to cost? Why do they need to fly these freeloaders over? Why? when they can just do it. Because so everybody in the world knows that these are the best two heavyweights at this moment in time. So why do we need the belts? It's, do you know, they could just have Ring Magazine belt, couldn't they, online? That would be enough, wouldn't it, really? They could. And to be honest, in this, in this day and age, I, I don't think modern fans are that worried about what belts are on the line. There's, there's way too many belts. We just want to see the best fight the best and just get on with it. Yeah. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. All right, then. What do you think next for Dylan White? Because he's sort of kind of like in no man's land now, isn't he? Well, I think um, I think he's in a bit of trouble. I, I, I bet he kicks himself and wishes that he fought Joshua for all the belts when he had the opportunity to, because now he's probably been waiting a couple of years to fight for a belt. Um, for In terms of his next fight, potentially he could fight against someone like Pulev, for example. He could fight Joshua's leftovers. He could, he could fight somebody like, um, if he wanted to challenge himself, one of the up-and-coming up and guys, 
to fight a Joe Joyce or a Yoko to try and prove himself that, like one of your comments is that he's, he's always fighting 40 year old men to so potentially could fight one of the up and coming guys. But then on the flip side of that, what does he gain from that? You know, he, he, he's at a position now where he's getting big money to fight against people who are past their prime. So does he really want to risk, risk it all against somebody who's not got any belts and not getting any, any rankings to um, benefit him? It's, it's going to be a hard one. Yeah. Do you see Dylan White fighting somebody like a Bryant Jennings or somebody like or a Malik Scott next? Someone somebody like that? Um potentially, but those guys I see a little bit like banana skin opponents because they could Dylan, just, yeah, like, Dylan. just have one, you know what I mean? And just have have um uh, like um Kevin Johnson just fought the other day and he he fought against the um the undefeated cruiser he just moved up. The Cuban crew, he just moved up to heavyweight and he beat him. Look how many losses Kevin Johnson's got. Yeah. So you, you get those guys who've got that really good schooling and you never know, they can potentially pull off that one big upset and then where does it go from there? Do you think Dylan White will take the Del Boy rematch if it's pay-per-view? I do, yeah. I think that's the the natural, easy fight to, na to make, isn't it? The, the fans love the first two. Um, They're both life and death. So a third one could potentially be good for casuals, but I don't think any of the hardcores or anyone watching this channel would, get, would be interested in seeing that, to be fair. Do you feel that if Dylan White fights Chisora for a third time, that's nine pay-per-views for Dylan and Chisora altogether, and not one of them pay-per-views has been for a world title. Do you think that's in bad taste if that happens? It is, but um, pay-per-view can only happen if, if us as fans uh, you... choose, to, to choose to pay and watch it. If people just, just voted with their wallets and said, look, I'm not paying for that, show me something decent, then the pay-per-views would like rapidly decrease. But um, people need to get behind the, uh, the streaming and get on them sites and sort of stop uh, Stop jumping onto the bandwagon and the pain for fights that you know are not going to be up to the standard that we want to see, and then I will, then we'll see less of it. That, that's what I think we will need to start doing. We'll see some more of these these fights coming onto free free television. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. That. All right then. Uh, what do you think next for Yui Fury? I know he's only twenty six in that, but what what do you think next for Yui? I think he's coming really well, Hugh. Um, I, I liked him in his live performance. I thought he showed a lot more. Um, spite in his punches, and he, he was he was really teeing up on on whack, and, and um, I, I loved the way that he was using uh, check hooks and establishing that jab, and really using a ramrod jab and, and pressuring him back with it, and then setting up the, the one twos behind that. Um, I think I think for for Hugh, it's just a case of beating beating more guys of that caliber, maybe one or two more fights at that level, um, and then get himself into a mandatory position for a belt, and then maybe in a year's time. He'd be, he'd be ready to, to take on one of those uh, belt holders and, and, and establish himself there and become a become a champion. But I, I think he's on the cusp now. I'd like to see you, myself personally, fight for a European title or at some stage and, and then maybe move on to a world title. But Joe Joyce has got that now. So if Joe vacates, we could see you fight for a European. I'd like to see that. Yeah, that'll be a good fight, definitely. What do you think for about Joe Joyce, Daryl? I think Joe Joyce has done it the hard way, to be honest. I really rate him. Um, from from the get-go, he's just been fighting tough opponents. He's got a style that, as a fan, you you can't really appreciate unless you look at the nuances of, of what he what he's doing. He's got a very awkward rhythm um, and time of how he throws his shots, and he's extremely powerful and durable. Um, I, I I liked him against the Dubois. I think he. He showed that um, even against a massive puncher like Dubois, his chin, his chin can hold up at that level. My thing for him would be the more fights and the longer his career goes on with that kind of style where you're taking a lot of shots on, like straight dead on in the face, um, it takes its toll on you. So he's probably going to have a, quite a short career, I feel. So um, he just needs, I think he needs to try and fight Usyk for that WBO um, as, as soon as possible. Uh, he, he, he's, uh, he's in a good position for it now, so if they can push for that, um, it'd be good. Usyk, for me, is a fantastic fighter, but um, he's only had two fights at heavyweight. First fight against Chaz um, Witherspoon, I felt that he was just finding his feet at heavyweight. Um, he took quite a lot of damage. If you look after the fight, he's, he's, he was quite marked up. Then he was injured for a little while, um, and then he had his second fight just now against Chisora. 
played with Chisora, but he never really looked like getting Chisora out of there. Mm. So I'm not sure if Usyk's answered the question of does he have the power to stop guys? We know he could probably outpoint outpoint guys at heavyweight over the distance, but the problem at heavyweight that he has is he's, he's a smaller guy. So can he stay out of trouble for 12 rounds consistently? Yeah. It's, it's going to be a bit challenging for him. So I, I think Joe Joyce would answer that question for us. Yeah. Do you feel that Joe Joyce could maybe be the best start at lot of them? Well, you never know. We'll find out. Um, I do feel that against against guys with movement, he potentially will struggle. So I could see Fury giving him a lot of problems. Do you know a good fight for Joe Joyce? That, I'd, that person I'd like to see would be Joe Joyce against Parker because Parker moves a lot. So I'd like to see how, how Joyce deals with that, with pinning a guy like Parker down and finishing him, if yeah. possible. Yeah. What do you think about uh, Usyk? He's my my uh, tip to do really well, Usyk, heavyweight. What do you think about him, Daryl? I think he's great. What I like most about him is um, he can fight. He can fight going forward and going back. Um, his pivots, um, especially one one thing that he, I noticed that he likes to do is. He'll faint, draw guys to lead, and then counter, and then pivot off, and then set up that so the phase two and phase three attacks from there. Um, really, really good fighter. Um, I just wonder if potentially he might be too small for the top guys. So for a um, Joshua Wilder, um, Fury. Um, but saying that, I think with his style, it gives all of them problems because he's he's that awkward and that elusive that they're going to have to come to him. And at times, they might potentially leave themselves exposed where he can then counter and do his best work. So, um, yeah, I, I, do, I do rate Usyk. He's, he's one in my top three, for sure, um, pound for pound fighters that I like to watch. Oh, right. Uh, all right, then, moving on. Cruiserweights. What do you think about Lawrence Acoli? Uh, would you pay to watch him? If you ask me if I paid to watch him before his last fight, I'd say definitely not. He had that sort of, um, he had a very awkward and um, boring star where he'd just tee off with one or two shots from long range. And then if, if, if those shots missed, he'd fall in and hold over and over again, just um, jab and grab merch. And it was really boring to watch. But in his last fight, albeit the opponent was very, very poor. Um, he looked good. He looked he looked like a nice man, but that opponent was poor. So let's see him let's see him do it against a champion, and then we can say he's arrived. But I can definitely see some of the improvements that McGuigan's uh, made with him. Um, but yeah, off off of that off the basis of that one fight, would I pay to watch him? Probably not. No, I wouldn't. No. All right then. Uh, the light heavyweight scene at the moment. He seems to be well. It should seem to be hotting up, but it isn't. Like, you know, there's Jose Burton, Callum Johnson, Boatsy, you know, people like that. And there's people not fighting people, isn't there? Do you feel that Joe Gallagher's stable with Jose Burton, Callum Johnson, Natasha Jones, Beefy Smith? Do you feel that they get a bit of a raw deal from Matchroom and the powers that be? It seems like it because uh, Callum Johnson, if we take him as an example, had a fantastic performance against Paterbiev, um, dropped him, gave Paterbiev a life and death fight that nobody before or since has been able to do. And he hasn't fought since. And I, I, I don't really get that. He's an exciting fighter. So why would you not just match him up against some of the guys in-house? So um, there's Bivol there, there's, um, there's Boazzi there, and there's even Anthony Yard domestically. So why, why not make those fights happen? I, I don't really understand why they've been why he's been frozen out. Um, Callum Smith has had his opportunity just now against um, Canelo, um, albeit a, a different weight, super middleweight. But um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> maybe maybe Gallagher's pissed um, Hearn off and, and uh, that's, that's maybe the reason why. But it, it's, it's a bit odd because I think Joe Gallagher's got some good fighters. It'd be good to see them all in the mix. You know what? I give Joe Gallagher a bit of respect, actually, for coming out and speaking up for his fighters because we've all given him some stick of it years. You know, my stick's mainly been because they were screaming for Crawler Linares rematch and he didn't deserve it, but they had it in a contract. So that's Joe being a, a manager as well, you know, looking after Crawler. So we have to give Joe respect there, don't we? I, I didn't know that until recently. But 
we all give him stick, but he goes into bat for his fighters, doesn't he? He does, and you can you can only really sorry about that. Let's get that. No, no problem, mate. Sorry for that, guys. No uh, problem. Yeah, we're back. Joe Gallagher. Yeah, so I think. Um, I, so, uh, what, do you want to repeat the question? Sorry, mate. Yeah. Joe Gallagher, do you feel that he gets a bit of a raw deal and things like that from the powers that be? Because he spoke out, didn't he, about what 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 he perceived as being Natasha Jonas not getting the rematch with Terry Harper, and he had a bit of a pop about. Other, other fighters he's got that are not getting chances. Callum Johnson, they offered him shocking money to fight jo uh, Boatsy, and then they halved it, didn't they? Or they knocked a lot off it for uh, well, because of the pandemic. So, do you feel that they've had a bit of a raw deal? I think they have, but if whenever money and politics is involved, what you say and how you say it becomes so important because by Joe saying certain things, it then puts pressure on her and her other people to to uh, to reveal information they may actually not want to reveal and then they take that back they, they might then take revenge on Joe Gallagher for example by freezing out his photos so it, it becomes very murky it's a shame that it's like that but um, I think that's sort of the way the world whenever money's involved isn't it mm. yeah it's uh, it, it, it's I think that match room it's a bit clicky at the moment i think there's certain people get certain opportunities and other people don't and i feel that they can they can feel badly done to i think callum johnson natasha jonas beefy smith i mean he signed with from frank warren had been there all his career he's had a fight with eggington what what else have they really done for him match room yeah yeah, it's, it's not delivered yeah. for him, have the beefy. He's in no man's land and he's got a high ranking as well. So, would you like to see beefy against you, Bank? That's a good fight. But um, you could say, what's in it for you, Bank? Because he's on the cusp of a, of a world title shot now against um, uh, either Charlo or. or um, is, he, is he mandatory for. Is it Golovkin or Canelo? He's mandatory for it as well. One of those interim belt. He's an interim champion, so he's mandatory for a belt now. Yeah, he's he's, he's right. He's ranked high. You bank. He's a good fighter, I think. Yeah, he's ranked high. So he 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 want, he wants to fight belt holder, doesn't he? So um, and 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 sort of and and well, can you call it a unification with his IBO belt? I don't know if you can yeah, call you it can. that. But, I, I uh, like IBO, me. You know what, don't you? But I, I, I'm a big champion. I know you. Yeah. Team IBO, Ed Levine. Because they just <laughs> they just seem to not be controversial. They're, all the others, <clears throat> they're doing what they want with these mandatories, aren't they? They are, yeah. They are, completely. It's not good, you know. The, the, uh, other, uh, WBA slipping anybody into the top 15 if you pay them, don't they? And, and it's they shocking do. what's going on. But, uh, but, yeah, so... But if you bank can get a fight with Beefy or drop down a weight to fight Beefy, I think that's a good fight. I think that's. A, I think that's. What, a, what do you think about uh, Charlo Eubank as a fight? I think that's a great fight as well. But would Eubank take that? Because maybe Charlo's technically a bit better. I would have Charlo as the favourite um, person. Yeah, only just it, fifty-five, forty-five, isn't it? Yeah, something like that. Because if if you look at the styles, they're both on top fighters and they like to come forward. But Charlo's a naturally bigger man, so you'd have to favour uh, him there. And, Especially, I think, in terms of, I think Charlo's um, mid-range and inside work may be a little bit cleaner and crisper than Eubanks. Yeah. Because he throws shorter punches, Eubank quite, throws quite wide with his hooks. So, potentially, if they're thrown at the same time, you can see Charlo catching him. What do you think about Billy Joe Saunders? Has he been a waste of space this last five years since he won world title? Or has he turned the corner now he's gone back to Mark Tibbs? And Jimmy Tibbs. Um, Saunders is a fantastic fighter. Um, I think we saw the best of him so far um, when he fought Lemieux. But since then, what, like, what, what has he really done? It's a shame. I, I would have liked to see him take the Canelo fight just just now. Um, I know it was offered to him and it was on short notice. But 
I think with Canelo, he's always going to give his opponent short notice because he can, because he's Canelo. So sometimes you just got to play ball on, on their terms and go up against the odds and, and do your best and, and try and make it happen. Um, I, I really rated what Callum Smith did, taking it on short notice like he did and, and stepping up to the challenge. And I think Saunders needs to do the same. Hopefully, um, he's now back onto top form with, with Tibbs. Um, in the last performance that we saw against um, Murray, um, I feel like Saunders fights to the level of his opponents. And I don't think Murray had enough to really bring the best of Saunders out. Um, so it, it, I think we need to see him in with the top guys now to see the best of him. Mm. Do you think Billy Joe Saunders beats Canelo at 168? Or does he need to go to 160 to have an advantage? I don't think he beats Canelo either of those ways, to be honest. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think I, I, I would have at one six eight. I'd have Canelo sixty forty favorite. I, I just think that Canelo's um, catch and shooting is um, his defense and his counter punch. It might be a little bit too much, and he hits. He, he's so powerful because when we saw like um, the Smith fight, for example, I think it was in the second round. He caught Smith with a body shot, and then from that point on, where Smith was backpedaling and just covering up uh, so that power that he's that he's got is enough to take people off their game plan yeah. Um, and, and yeah I just think it might be too much yeah what, where do you think Savannah Marshall goes from here now now that Clarissa Shields has gone over to MMA what, what do you think next for Savannah do you think she's in limbo definitely now because the natural fight would have been that um, that Clarissa Shields fight uh, but it, I, I don't understand that MMA move from from Shields because she's not got an MMA background, and as someone who's trained a little bit in it in it myself, it, it takes a long time to us to establish the fundamentals of wrestling and jiu-jitsu and all of that kind of thing, and 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 be an actual threat. So, what was it? Was it like a was it a duck move to get out of fighting Clarissa Shields? I, I don't know. It seemed a uh, scout fighting um, um, Savannah Marshall. Sorry, it's very very odd, and it kind of has left her in, in limbo. Yeah, I think it has. Yeah. All right then. Uh, Connor Ben. What do you think about Connor Ben? Uh, much improved fighter. Um, I yeah. think he's put in a lot of hard work. Um, and if you compare him from his debut to now, he looks like a, a proper polished professional. Fighter, isn't it? He looks like a really good fighter. He does. Different fighter, yeah. He, he, uh, he's had a lot of stick. You know why he's had stick? He's had a lot of stick because they slipped him in WBA rankings at number six. He'd not won a belt. And that kind of thing goes on behind the scenes. But <clears throat> that's done because they've got sponsors. And it's all performance related, you know, when you've got blue chip companies behind you and stuff. But for me, that's where the fans, well, especially the hardcore fans, said, yeah, that's not right, that. Connor Ben, Connor ben number six. But now you could... It's, 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 Number 15 WBA, and I don't know if he's top 15. I'd like to think he's top 25 in the world at the moment, Conor Ben, not 15. But if they've got him in at 15, he's obviously because he's won a certain belt with WBA at some point, and he? Trinket belts. But do you feel that he should go back to British rule and go through the levels, you know, kind of thing? I think you could apply that, um, that logic to a lot of fighters, to be fair, Russ. But I think the way I, the way I kind of pose it to myself is a lot of a lot of modern boxers want to get to the they want to get the money and get to the top of the mountain as fast as possible. They want to go the short route. Mm. They they don't want to go the traditional route and collect all the belts at the right levels. I know you, I know from watching you you, you always um, talk about the benefits of going through the levels correctly. Six levels, a lot of there, really, British Commonwealth European world, isn't it? It's not, you know. It's... Do you feel that people are taking shortcuts to get to world level? Definitely. I think they are. Like, look at Anthony Yard. He, he, he bypassed all of the levels pretty much. Didn't win, didn't win any of those, the, the other level, and jumped straight to world level. And I think, was it $2 million that he got um, that he got for the fight? So, yeah, so jump, jumped in against Kovalev. He lost, but you could say he secured his future. So was it better for him to go through the levels and potentially get beaten, or was it better for him to do what he did? It's, it's hard to say, isn't it, Russ? Yeah, it is. It, does he take the money now or does he go through levels and miss the money? You know, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. But 
if you move on from Anthony Yard, to, uh, his matchmate, the matchmaking and how he's been matched, how do you feel that his training situation's going at the moment with Tunde Ajayi? Do you think that they'll part company or they'll bring somebody in to help as well? Or, and if they do that, could would Tunde's ego, ego allow it? Because he's a manager as well, isn't he? Very strange what's going on there. After the fight, Tunde Ajayi did a, an interview that was uploaded onto, I think it was uploaded onto Frank Warren's promotion um, YouTube channel, which was then removed within a couple of hours of being uploaded. Then he's done no media, um, uh, done no media. And then I, I think I saw he did um, a one-on-one -on -one interview with a, a, an interview reporter that I've, I've not heard of before and sort of spoken a little bit about the training situation. And then there was the, um, the strange um, sort of obscure tweet from Yard about he's going to address his training situation at the end of 2020. Uh, we've now not heard anything. I, I honestly think they're going to stay together. Um, I think... Tunde is taking him to this point and maybe all, maybe what they actually need is somebody to come in and add a different dimension to the training. A couple of um, days a week. Just, yeah, a couple of days a week just to assist and add things on top. Um, I, 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 don't see, I don't see the training situation changing where he, he's going to completely move camp and go to somebody else. I could be wrong, but I think at this stage of his career, it takes so long for you to... Um, bed in with a new trainer, understand how they like to train and for them to get you and understand your style and add to it that it, it might just take too long um, and maybe this needs to add a few things like a little bit of a short, uh, quick, sharp um, tweaks rather than changing his whole style, if that makes sense. <clears throat> Do you feel that all them people on social media and on forums who are coming out of things like that he should go to Adam Boo, do you think that's a bit of a cliche now or... Do you think he would go to Adam Booth? Or I don't know. What do you think? Uh, I don't see it happening. I think um, one thing that people often don't think about is training's often about personalities. Mm -hmm. Like, you can, someone can be a fantastic trainer, but you go and do a passage with them, or you go spend time with them, you just don't click with them as a person. And then that means that that would then like negatively impact your boxing relationship with that coach. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you, you need to have someone that gets and understands you as a bench line first, and then you have the boxing on top of that. And I think from what, from what I've seen on, on media and stuff, it looks like a Jai and Yard get on really well, doesn't it? So maybe they just need someone to help them with the boxing side. Do you feel that trainers, being managers as well, as a conflict of interest with a fighter, if they were unhappy with a bit of management or they were unhappy with some in training and that, and do you think the the fighters kind of like caught in middle kind of thing? Do you think that's a conflict of interest, or do you think it can be a good thing? I definitely think it's a conflict of interest because even if you look at we talk if we go back to what you were saying about going for the different levels, um, if your trainer is also your manager. It's in their interest to rush you through the levels so that they get paid as much money as they can as fast as possible. If you go the, if they take you around the long route and potentially you go through all the level and you, and you get beaten at let's say European level, you don't make it to world level. They've now capped their own earning potential. But if you flip it around, they're also they're also benefiting the fighter by being a manager because yeah. it's in their interest to take you to manage you correctly so you don't get beaten so that they get paid also. So it's, it's, it's a bit of a catch-22, but I don't, I don't really like the trainer manager situation. I think it's better to have separate people doing those jobs. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right, then. Moving on, then. The Dazone and Sky uh, intense beef at the moment or whatever they've got going on. Do you feel that Eddie's got a bit of brass neck putting Luke Campbell on Dazone last night? Where in England, uh, in, in uh, an English time as well, when Eddie's been with Sky all them years and Luke Campbell's been with Sky since he won gold medal 2012. Do you think that's in bad taste or do you think it's just Eddie being at ruthless Eddie? I think Eddie's just doing what he can get away with. Um, he knows that he can play both sides and he just he's just acting in his benefit to where he can make the most money. I, I don't think, um, embarrassment and shame is something that comes into Eddie's mind. He, he, he doesn't care about them things. He just goes straight for whatever makes the most money for himself and, and his clients, the boxers that he works with. I don't think he really has them kind of principles with us. Is that what you marketing guys are like? 
the, the money's the well, bottom dollar. Bottom line, money. Like, per, I, I think when it comes to when it comes to things like that, Eddie always says, "Oh, um, I, I work for my boxers, or my, my boxers are my clients, or whatever he usually says, whatever the line is." But the fans don't care about that. No. Fans want to see things done correctly and properly. So there's a conflict of interest there, isn't there? Yeah. So you know that's that's also another thing. So we're we're, we're never really going to be happy with with how he how he operates for us. Yeah. Where do you think this these losses of late for Frank Warren? You know, he's lost for the bar. Sorry, the bar lost against Joyce. Yards lost. Where, what do you uh, where do you see Frank now? Uh, do you think he's going to pick up the piece? Didn't he have another loss as well? I'm not sure. Do you think F- Frank's sort of like at a crossroads in his career now? Do you think because Fury's tied up in it with legal matters with Wilder and Bob Arum and that, and Frank's tied to Fury, so he's in active Fury. Yard's been beat. The bar's been beat. Do you think Frank's kind of like at a crossroads? He could walk from Sport or he'll he'll come again stronger, faster, quicker than a speeding bullet. What do you think, Daryl? I think Frank always always comes back um, eventually. Um, and to his credit, like I, I was really looking forward to seeing Dubois join. That, that was like one of the fights last year, the domestic ones, that I think was one of the, one of the um, best of the lot. And I'm really glad he put it on. So I don't like this thing where we... Um, Fans can sometimes put down the promoters when they put on a good fight and their and their guy loses because I, I want to see more of it. I want to see more of more promoters uh, matching up in house guys against each other and and even if the favourite loses, let's just applaud it and, and see more of that. We need to get um, these these good fights happening in boxing and not have to always wait for them to happen down the line. It's nice to see them when the guys are young and, and up and coming. So. Yeah, but yeah, I, I think uh, Warren will, will always be there or thereabouts, and it's good. It's good to have more than one um, promoter core in the shops. It's good to have a bit of a bit of a rivalry because it keeps the other guy in check. Monopolies aren't good, are they? Mm. Yeah. Uh, what next do you think for Mick Hennessy and Dennis Hobson after the recent show? Do you think they've got some regrouping to do to get back to what they were? Yeah, definitely. I know. Um, I know Tommy Frank um, lost the other day um, with, a, with a shoulder injury, I, I believe. But um, yeah, it, it's a shame because I would have liked to see him fight Sonny Edwards. Yeah, um, yeah. That would have been a good fight. So I guess we've lost out on that opportunity now. But um, yeah, where, where does where does Tommy Frank go from now? I don't know. Um, what, 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 what do you think? What, what do you think uh, Tommy Frank will do um, now? Uh, my only concern for Tommy Frank is how long he's going to be out he's 28 in a couple of weeks. He's 13 and one now. He's, had a, he's just had a loss, but he's had a bad injury. And, but he's not had a stoppage yet. So if you're not stopping people, I don't think you're a TV fighter that should be headlining. That's just my opinion. And it's very rare that we have flyweights headlining anyway. Forget all that. Well, he's a nice kid. He's this and that and blah, blah, blah. We want to see headline acts where they're stopping people, don't we? Now, if you haven't got a stoppage on your record, I think you've got a problem. And at that sort of way, if he's fragile for injuries and that, I don't know. Personally, I think they'll throw him under a bus now. I don't think they'll bring him back. I think he'll be put in a, in a fight where it gets him a bit of money back because he might not be the same fighter again. You know, after Do you he- think Sonny Edwards is a TV fighter, a main event fighter then? Because he's another um, guy who breaks... Albeit great skills, but he's a unanimous decision man, isn't he? He's never going to really yeah, be a guy that plays. Tommy had one stoppage, but Sonny's won every fight and he has had stoppages, but not every single one. He's not a KO artist, but you'd say he's got more to his more to his game than Tommy. But if they fought it, it'd be perfect to promote because you've got clean cut Tommy, aren't you? Who says right things, does right things. You know what I mean? Tommy's the type of kid who'll go, "Hey, up, Porky Ross, how are you doing? How oh, much respect and all that." He says all right things, doesn't he? Sonny Edwards will, will say, now then, Porky Russ, you look like Mitchell in man. You know, he, he, so the, the, the like worlds apart, so it'd be good to promote. But I think that, I think they've missed the boat to promote it because they should have took the fight 18 months ago when it were on table and they didn't. So Tommy's now in limbo, we're lost and not fought for a British title yet. 
So, the benefit of him being at that weight, though, um, Porky, is that um, there's not there's not that many guys domestically in, in that division. So with a couple of wins, he could probably um, challenge again Edwards for that yeah, British title. Yeah, easy to bring him back in that way if they bring him back. But for an headline fight, no, Cash Alley should be headlining Dennis the Stable. He's in every way. They should, mm. they should put some more effort into Cash and get him headlining and, and do some off back of him instead of feeding him nobodies. But it's hard to put fights on it, but you've got to give him credit for putting a show on in the pandemic. But it's hard to get fights on at the moment because of the pandemic. But I want to see a little bit of something around Cash Alley now. I want to see people giving him some PR, get some people up to Cash to Cash Alley's house or... Get get Dennis speaking about him on other platforms. Do, do you know what I mean? It's, you don't just have to do a few interviews in fight week and then you're not putting a show on for six months. Well, you're not going to speak about Cash Alley again for six months. It's got to be an everyday thing like your Joshua, your Billy Joes, your Furies. They're out there every day, aren't they, promoting themselves. Cash has got to help himself as well to get a bigger name. For example, and this is where boxing's gone wrong, but you've got to wish him well. Dave Allen's not won a belt, has he? No. He's a Sky Pundit now. John Fury, he's not won a belt. He's a Sky Pundit now because they get themselves out there, don't they? Cash Alley's, he's won a belt. He's, he won an area belt and they're talking about him going for an English belt, but he's not out there, is he? So does that blame Larry Cash or does it like blame where the people that are handling him? Because something's wrong, isn't it? Yeah. You know what I mean? So, but it is what it is, isn't it? But you have to get yourselves out there if you want to get in these big fights. But I wish him well. Uh, all right, what do you think about Josh Whale? I haven't seen um, that many Josh Whale's fights, to be fair. So, um, yeah, I can't, can't really comment on that one. But... He fought in February. He's not fought in 11 months now. But uh, I'd like to see Josh Whale against, I don't know, somebody at featherweight from UK in a domestic dust-up or a European title fight. I think he deserves it. He was 32. So we're going to see. But uh, All right, then. Uh, Eddie and Frank, are they ever going to work together? I don't see it happening. Not any time soon, anyway, because, um, well, it's not in, it's not in uh, Eddie's interest to do that because... Uh, he, he, he's doing just fine without working with Warren. They've hardly put any shows on um, together up to this point now, so I don't see I don't see that changing anytime soon. Um, I think Warren would probably like to do some shows because that that would reinvigorate the stable and and yeah. bring a bit more limelight and attention. So, but if we look at the recent trends, we've had, Warren's had a lot of fighters leaving to go over the other way. Like the last one, I think, was Lerone Richards, who went, he went the other way, vacated his titles. So he didn't have to uh, fight Hutchinson and, and gone the other way over to to her. And so it's not really a good pattern, to be fair. Um, yeah, I don't I don't really see them working together soon, though. You think Frank's heading for Skid Row? <laughs> I don't think Frank's ever uh, ever going to be. No, I mean, it's stable as regards him not not having big stars and that. I don't mean money wise. I mean as regards his stable. Do you think his stable's pretty weak now to what it used to be? Yeah, I think you could say that for sure. Um, but you know, he's, he's still got he's still got Dubois that he can bring back, and I think Dubois will Dubois will if he comes back will do well. Um, in a few a few years time, I think we'll see him challenging for titles. He's got he's, he's got a lot of he's got a, a fantastic um, baseline of fundamentals ready, and with a bit more experience and age behind him, I think he'll do well. And once this current crop of heavyweights have got older and cleared out, he'd be one of the guys I think that will move on to that position. So. Yeah, I, I, I do think um, I do think Warren's still got some some fighters that can uh, that can do things. You think Triple G against Beefy Smith's a good fight? Yeah, I think it could be a good time for um, for Beefy to get Triple G because um, I think he's on the on the downside. He's on the downside now. Um, he's he's uh, I think for, for Triple G, he'll he'll be wanting to fight guys like Canelo. I, I see I see Triple G fighting Canelo and then after that fight, win or lose, retiring. Um, and I think, but for Beefy, I think um, now would be a good time to get him because, uh, yeah, I, I don't I don't think Golovkin's really looked good um, in his last couple of fights. He's, he's taken a lot more punishment than he used to. And 
the way that he reacts to punches is, is not the same as before either. Uh, he's still got that power and he's still got fantastic skill set, but I just think age is catching up as, as it does with all, all fighters. Because it, it's, Triple G is in his, in his mid to late 30s now, isn't he? Yeah. What worries me about Triple G is he just had that fight with, I can't pronounce his name, that guy. The Polish fighter. Yeah. yeah. But uh, is Liam Smith any, any, any worse than that kid? Now I think Liam Smith beats that kid, Golovkin just fought. So why couldn't somebody at the zone? Have a word with Eddie Earn and get Beefy Smith in with Golovkin. Why not? He was up for the fight. They wanted it. Definitely. I think that'd be a good fight. Yeah. What next do you think for Luke Campbell? Do you think they'll put him in with Linares rematch or Tennyson or Ricky Burns? Or do you think he'll hang him up? I, I thought, uh, I really felt for Luke because I, I, thought, I thought that he could do more in that fight. Um, go, like right from the beginning, um, I thought when Garcia came out on the throne, the first thing that came into my mind is if he gets dropped or gets knocked out, this is going to become a meme. In that second round, um, when when Campbell caught him with the uh, with the rear hook and and dropped him, I think what he needed to do at that point was was pressure him and try and and try and finish him there. I understand it was early in the fight; and he didn't want to probably um, use use all of his um, his gas tank there. But he never really looked like he was trying to go for the finish. I think he was being patient, hoping that he'd be able to find that shot consistently again. And to his credit, in that round and in the round after, he did look for that same rear hook sort of slash bolo over the top. But um, he never really found a home for it because Garcia was, was blocking a lot of them. Um, and one thing that I think Garcia did really well was he... He, he, he bullied Campbell back. He never allowed him to establish a rhythm or get comfortable in the fight. Always made sure that Campbell was backed up against the ropes um, and, and pressured him. But um, yeah, I think where does Campbell go from here? He's lost against uh, Linares. He's lost against Campbell now. He lost against Lomachenko before. He, he's won an Olympic gold medal. I'm sure he's done well out of the sport. Does he, does he, does he want to continue? Um, if he does, I think he can come back. But uh, yeah, it just it just depends on how much hunger he's got left at this point, doesn't it? Because he's lost to a guy that's nearly ten years younger than him now, so it, it, it's kind of it's kind of a, a generational thing, isn't it? That that generation that Campbell's in is coming to the end of their prime and starting to be on the decline. That fresh up and coming crops now coming through. Yeah, yeah, you're right there, mate. Yeah, it's uh, it's going to be interesting times, isn't it? Do you think? Do you see any changes at Sky? There's been a few whispers, and the word around the campfire is there's going to be massive changes this year. Do you see any change in personnel with people behind the scenes? You know, Bean, Nelson, Bellew, you know, Froch, people like that. Do you see changes there, or do you see changes with the twenty dates a year that Sky hand out? Do you think they might be shared out of it? Uh, I could see that happening. Yeah, I think. I think. If I was Sky, I'd want to hedge my bets and think, right, let's not put all our eggs in with one promoter. Let's share some of these dates out and see what what um, type of shows and what up and coming talent we can also see with other promoters. They'll probably want to keep her in for an X number of dates, but then share the others out so they can also tap into views and stable and other people's stables. Um, yeah, I, I think they'd be making a massive mistake just putting all, lumping all of their eggs back in with her because. As we've seen just now with this like the zone fight with um Garcia and Campbell, he's got no loyalty to Sky. He'll put his fighters on whichever whichever channel is the best for him and his fighters. So yeah. I think Sky probably needs to look out for them themselves in the same way. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about the commentary last night uh, on Dazone, you know, with uh Gareth A. Davis, aka yeah. sorry, mate, go on. That's your phone. <laughs> I'm up and down like a bloody yo-yo. Sorry, sorry, guys. That's all right, mate. You got no pictures on your wall, uh, Daryl. <laughs> oh, this is my uh, yeah, my living room. Yeah, I got no no picture. Just moved in about a month ago. Sorry. Um. So what 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 was the last question? Sorry, Russ. Uh, I forgot now. Uh, forgot short. I think you were saying. I think you were saying about um design. Was it design? You were. GQ Man of the Year, Gareth A. Davis and Ricky Atten. 
uh, who looked a picture of health. <laughs> they, were, <laughs> they were the commentators, weren't they? What, what did you think to uh, what do you think to them? Could I mean personally, like Gareth Fay Davis for me, like you, the, they they're all there, but they, they want to keep the position there, so the they're not the, the narrating story. They're not telling it as it is, and this is a problem I've got. When I turn on uh, the football, especially Amazon, they're brilliant. These um, this Amazon are doing Premier League now, aren't they? And the pundits that work there, and you've got Shearer and people like that, and uh, they're telling it straight what they're seeing. Gareth A. Davis were trying to spin some at last night. He made Bean look like a like a, a, a an expert. You know what I mean? Rough, tough, rugged, durable, all action, compelling, <laughs> and then spice, <laughs> sizzling. I Gareth A. Davis commentary style isn't for me. To be fair, I, he uses way too many words, and he's, he's a bit too fluffy for for my taste for what I like to hear when I'm watching the boxing. Um, on the zone, I, I was watching the American broadcast, so I, I think it was Sergio Mora and and um, his his co-presenter, whoever that guy is, I don't know who he is. Um, that was it was really cringeworthy. Yeah, Chris Mannix, wasn't it, or something like that? Chris Mannix, yeah, yeah. They were. It was really awful. They just kept um, uh, basically tugging off bloody Garcia and talking about everything, everything non-related to boxing. Talking about Instagram followers, social media um, followers, and all this type of stuff that we don't really care about. Um, but yeah, um, dur during like in between rounds, they cut to Gareth A. Davis and, and they cut to um, to Hatton. Um, Hatton was saying some intelligent stuff, to be fair, about how uh, things that Campbell needed to, to do in order to um, in order to win. Um, but yeah, Gareth A. Davis wasn't wasn't cutting it for me. I, I think he him and Chris Mannix are, are, are quite poor um, in terms of commentary. Yeah, what did you think to uh, Shane McGuigan getting having a selfie with Canelo in ring afterwards? Could you see Joe Gallagher doing that with Beefy Smith? I can't. Or um, I think... with Rocky Fielding and Canelo, you know, after Rocky. I, Bond, I, I, I think those trainers would be more concerned with they'll be more gutted that their fighters are lost yeah. and that they haven't done what they set out to do, rather than you know wanting to get selfies and pictures and so on but uh yeah it, it it's a bit a bit odd it was a bit odd but um what one one thing um for me was that i wonder what campbell's tactics were going into that fight because he's never going to win on points it, with a style that with, with, with in america where they prefer come come forward fighters with his style that's quite upright amateurish and going backwards he's never going to win on points especially against garcia so what i would have liked to see him do more was once he once he realised that he could hurt Garcia, would try, try and jump on him, try and counter punch with a bit of conviction. But it felt to me like he he, he was he was banking on the fact that he dropped him once, and he was trying to nick rounds, and he wanted to like do it just do enough to nick rounds um, consistently over twelve rounds and try and outpoint him and get decision. But I think um, what we really saw was that Garcia was buzzing off of the crowd. So every time Garcia would get Campbell hurt or he'd land a big shot, the crowd would go would go bananas, and then he he then come come back with more of a flurry and throw more combinations. And he was he was he had he had the exuberance of youth, and he was really buzzing. And 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 at one point, um, Eddie Reynoso in the corner was telling him to calm down um, because he he was he was doing too much. I think it was at the end of the fifth or the sixth round, telling him to calm it down a little bit. And Canelo was in the crowd telling him to calm it down. And once he settled, once he settled back into his boxing, um, yeah, Garcia did, did really, really well to to get the finish. But I, I would have, I would have liked to see Campbell do more because I think I, I feel like if he's honest with himself, he probably had more to give and more to show. And I don't think he did himself justice. I think he could have done more. Yeah, it's a, it's an hard one. But do you feel that Luke Campbell? Uh... He won the gold medal 2012. We're now 2021. He's another one not gone through levels. He's only got a Commonwealth belt, hasn't he? Do you, do you feel that he should have gone through levels and learnt his craft a bit more? Yeah, potentially. I think that I think also doing that would have added a few different more elements to his style. Because I think if he'd gone through the levels, he might have come across um, some 
different styles and then worked out how to break them styles down. So if he'd, if he'd had more fights at those levels, he'd have more experience to then be able to become more adaptable. So when he comes up against these, these elite level guys, he's, he's got more tricks to his arsenal. Campbell fights one way and it's really good, technically brilliant, um, but he's taken that amateur style that he's had from the Olympics and then just worked on perfecting that one style rather than adding some other variations to that style. Um, because if, if you do everything textbook, then that's great, but then it's easy for guys to study that same textbook and reverse engineer it and work out how to beat you. If you've got a bit more flair and dynamism to your style and you can do different things, it's harder for guys to figure you out. So um, yeah, it, it would, be, would have been good, I think, to see him go through more levels. Yeah, do you feel that, uh, sorry, sorry, who do you feel that Luke Campbell's top four wins are? Ah, uh, good question. I think it's out of my head, to be fair. I think Perez, Dark yeah. Perez, Derry Matthews, former WBA uh, interim. Yeah. Do you Definitely. feel. Tommy Coy. Tommy but Coy. These, but these guys. Mendy rematched him, didn't he? Mendy three years later, he rematched him. He did, and he, and he beat him. But I, I don't think I don't think any of these guys have an elite or world class style that would have prepared Campbell to then be able to do what he needed to do at that that elite level. He probably he probably faced better guys than amateurs, to be fair. Yeah, yeah, probably, yeah. Uh, do you feel that he's maybe misspoke now to winning a world title because the 135 divisions that red art, the, the guys that are there that are, are really elite? Devin Haney, Tiafimo Lopez, Ryan Garcia and Lomachenko. I don't see um, Campbell beating any of those four. Uh, um, well, he's fought but, two of them, hasn't he? Yeah, he's fought two and he's got, and he's got two losses. Um, I think the weakest, the weakest of those four is... Devin Haney, um, but I still think Devin Haney would have too much for Campbell, um, and and and, the, and the three out of three out of four of those guys are also under the age of twenty six, and Luke Campbell's thirty three years old, so he, age isn't on his side either. So um, in those lighter weight classes where it's more explosive and relying on your speed and reflexes, that's going to that's diminishing on on his side, and the other guys have got that in their favour as well as the skill set. So yeah, it's going to be tough. Yeah. All right then. Lastly, we'll touch on YouTubers: Logan Paul, Jake Paul, KSI, Conor McGregor, Pacquiao, Mayweather. What do you reckon to all that cesspit of a mix? Unfortunately, I think we're going to see more of it because um, it does numbers in Eddie's uh, in Eddie's words. I, I, I don't like it because I think someone's actually going to end up getting hurt. We, we nearly saw someone get hurt in the last one when you had a, one of the Paul brothers fighting that basketball player. He was out iced for like a minute or so on the floor. That can't be good. And eventually someone's going to get badly hurt. So uh, I, I don't want to see that because that's just going to put then a, a dark shadow over the rest of boxing where you don't really need it, to be fair. You think it's a kick it nuts for all them kids that put the hard work in? You know, who go amateur, then turn pro, and they have to sell tickets. And you know, your crawlers, people like that, and uh, your Josh Wales, Josh Warringtons. You know, people who put the time in as amateurs and pros and work the way up. Do, do you feel that it's a kicking notes for them sort of lads coming through, and these just turn up and get the top end at money? Definitely, because if like imagine imagine being a young guy who's fought like maybe the amateurs, the ABAs, whatever, and you're selling tickets. And then you're on the undercard to a guy who's never had a fight in his life. And all he's done is get an Instagram following off of some YouTube videos that he's, that he's done. And he's getting paid millions to versus whatever money that you're getting. You, you're bound to feel a bit better about that. And I think you'd be entitled to as well. Um, it, it's, not, it's not good to see. You, 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 wouldn't, you wouldn't see in tennis, um, like down at Wimbledon, you wouldn't see um, some YouTuber headlining and then Roger Federer like, playing on the second court. It's, it's not going to happen. It's, it's very bizarre why boxing allows these things to happen. Um, and I think the root of it all is people are just too greedy where, where it relates to the money. Um, it's not good. 
Yeah, it's like, for example, me and you, Daryl, working down pit, and we're on 500 quid a week as coal face workers, and there's some other guys on five grand a week. We're not going to be happy about that, are we? Not a chance, no. You know, we've took years to get to that position, on working on coal face, on cutting machines, hacking into coal, and they just turn up and they're pressing a button and, uh, and doing the same sort of thing, but an easier job and 10 times more money. They'd be hell on, wouldn't they? Yeah, they would be. And it's, yeah, it, in, in any profession, if you've got someone with no experience coming into what your line of work that you've been grafting on for years, and then they're, they're getting paid more money than you, you think, what's going on here? It's just ridiculous. <laughs> you so, wouldn't have any of that, would you, in marketing, then, would you? <laughs> <laughs> Not a chance, man. I'd be right on that. You'd not be getting invited to any barbecues, would you, if you said your bit, though? It's, the whole <laughs> of the it's bar yeah, barbecue then. time down your way now, isn't it, in Sydney? What's that, mate? They all have barbecues, don't they, over there, don't they, a lot, don't they, Australia? Yeah, a lot of people got barbecues going and people got them in their houses and, and, and whatnot. And, uh, yeah, it's, uh, yeah, barbecues are all over the place. They love it. Barbecue people have it on Christmas Day and all sorts. It's, uh, yeah, very oh, different. yeah, you're older because it's warm, isn't it? Yeah, it'd it, it, like, it be like 26, 27 degrees on a Christmas Day and people would be, people be down on a beach or whatever else. It doesn't feel like Christmas, really. Um, yeah, it's a bit odd. Bit different to Luton at Christmas, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, very, very different. You don't have to worry about uh, le leaving uh, your, your lights, your lights off, and the way you nip, where you nip out, and you come back and your TV's gone. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! All right, then. Well, listen. Thank you for coming on, Daryl. You, you've been a good guest. You don't speak over me, and you speak clearly. You've got a good opinion, and I think you've been one of one of good guests that I've had on uh, in the last few months. So thanks for coming on, and I hope we can do it again. It's been a You've been a real tonic. <laughs> Cheers for having me, Paul. Um, yeah, it's been good speaking to you, mate. And uh, keep doing what you're doing. The channel's great. Thank you very much. And I hope you have a great day. You'll be going to bed now, won't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah, bed now. I've got work in the morning. So, uh, yeah, oh. thanks for having me. No you take care, Daryl. All the best, you and your family. And keep on trucking, my friend. See you, Paul. Cheers, mate. Bye. Nice one. See you. Uh, that were Daryl from Luton, lives in Sydney. Uh, seemed a nice kid, didn't he? Seemed a nice kid. He uh, he looked like somebody, well, I'm trying to think who his name is now. So he looked like somebody that I've met before in boxing. So I thought, when I seen him come on, I thought, I'm sure I've met him before, but obviously I haven't. But I enjoyed that. He, uh, you can see he's a bit a bit educated. He reminded me a bit of Rico, to be honest. You know, we... we uh, his answers, but I think he's one of good guests. I enjoyed that. I hope he's going to come on again. So, Daryl, if you're watching, thanks for coming on. And I think that's about it. We've just got one more to do today. And uh, then it's porky time. So, peace out. Keep on trucking. Keep sporting boxing. Shout out to AJ Hobson at Innovation Alloys. Can I just say that Innovation Alloys is not to do with car alloys for uh, those people that keep asking me if I can get them a discount at Innovation Alloys. It's not car oil, uh, car oils. It's not car alloys. It's uh, it's precious metals. So that whatever, I don't know. It's same sort of thing what Dennis does, but it's precious metals. So no, it's not to do with... Uh, the gentleman that emailed me yesterday with the golf uh, asking if I can get him any 19 inches for his for his golf off innovation and would I get a bit better discount than some other company we're going on about. Sorry, mate, it's, they don't do alloy wheels there. You might see a few inch scrapyard that are damaged on a big pile, but it's not to do with precious metal. So I just want to point that out. But shout out to AJ Innovation and South Yorkshire Packaging. Thank you very much. Uh, Peace out.